me, but I'm Pete Wyden, and I host the Professional Permaculture Designer Facebook group. I also have my own design business, Artisan Environments, uh, based in Minnesota. And I also began um, about six months ago managing a farm a quarter section, 160 acres in Wisconsin. And I'm actually going down there um, this weekend. We're going to start planning things out for a uh, geothermal greenhouse that we applied for a grant for. And we're also uh, looking at some other grants from Midwest farming agencies and getting some perennial systems up and running there. And I also offer design sales and business monetization mentorship for the permaculture and ecological design communities. Get your business going, simplify things, have it running in a way on autopilot for your marketing and sales. So we have a special guest today. He's already, um, he's already mentioned something. Already <laughs> yeah, he's, we're already started. Dan Halsey uh, of Southwoods Ecosystem and Agroecology Design, also based in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, but doing design around the country and around the globe in various ways. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that as we're talking about the plants in the natural capital database here. Dan is also a partner in United Designers, which is a really interesting and um, up and coming international permaculture and ecological design cooperative. Um, it's, it's a group that I'm a part of as well. Uh, we can talk a little more about that, but we had a webinar um, where we did get into that a little bit more a couple weeks ago. But feel free to reach out to either me or Dan if you're interested in finding out more about this collaborative where we're able to draw on each other's expertise, hire each other for projects and uh, make things easier, get better design done, etc. So Dan's going to be teaching, as far as I know, an advanced design course in Madrid, Spain in May uh, via United Designers España. So let him know if you're interested in attending that. And also on May 3rd to the 5th, he's going to be appearing at the Earth Repair Conference in Port Townsend, Washington here in the U.S. Um, which should be pretty cool. Well, yeah. Great people gather there, I bet. Looking forward to that very much so. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Barushka is here too, and she's uh, an active member of United Designers in the Netherlands. So um, I guess it's not too Barushka. late in the day yet, but it's getting pretty late there. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we've actually worked on a couple of projects together. So um, yeah, so at, it's so yeah, she's she's active in, in United Designers and working on things. And we just had another conversation uh, this week with uh, somebody from Canada who's part of United Designers too. And, working on some projects and we're trying to integrate that but anyway hi Wershka I see you all right so uh, thanks for joining us today everybody and if you're on the recording uh, feel free to send us a message or comment um, in the Facebook group as well if you do have questions going forward so we're gonna be looking into the natural capital plant database today which is an extremely useful tool a well curated um, group of plants from around the world um, Dan co-founded this database with Paula Westmoreland of Ecological Gardens, who's also based in Minnesota, at least at the time, and many others have helped along the way. I was just looking on the site, and there's probably eight yeah. or ten other people contributing that are on there, a bunch of people on web support and things, so it's really a, a group effort. Yeah, and uh, I think Paula, her first idea for this was in 2003, wow. um, and got a Sarah Grant, got it started, a lot of volunteers, a lot of work. And then um, I got on to it about 2006. And then 2009, we decided to actually, okay, we need to invest some money in this. Maybe it was eight. We need to get some, you got you to buy services. You can't just like do everything for people for free because it doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. Uh, getting professional services done. And then all of a sudden it got, so we went from 1,300 plants. I think we have about almost 2,300 to 2,500 plants now mm -hmm. on there. And we have another 7,000 on deck just waiting to get in. <laughs> wow. Uh, unfortunately, as you'll see, it takes time mm -hmm. uh, to get these done. And so uh, we have to hire people, and we always pay people to do the work and uh, to, in order to get more plants to get in. But Paula has very much been a stickler from day one. All information has to be cited. It has mm -hmm. to come from scientific data. It's just not a bunch of uh, things that people, you know. I mean, tradition is great. And cultural practices are great, but we have to make sure that they're actually true and not just stories. So especially when it gets into medicinals and things like that. And as you'll see in our site, all the characteristics, all the tolerances, all those kinds of things are cited. And we even have the sources for a lot of the data that we have because that's how we are. Um, so we want to make sure that that's you know, all correct. On the other hand, if the plant is used for food, 
guess how much information you get from us on that? It's like, yes, you can eat it. Okay, now Google the rest. Because <laughs> uh, it's like everything is fiber. Everything is some kind of food for somebody somewhere. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, we don't get into that. And even especially in the medicinals, because uh, medicine, uh, I, I learned this from Chinese, uh, studying Chinese medicine and Chinese medicinals, is that what happens when you take a medicine when you're not sick? It makes you sick. Mm -hmm. So medicinals, especially medicinal plants, are intended for you when you're not well. So there's a difference between supplements, nutrients, all those kinds of things, and eating greens and foraging and actually biting the bottom of a red beet root or something when you don't have a lot of phlegm in your throat. It's going to burn as opposed to when you're trying to get rid of the phlegm. It doesn't because that's what it does. It helps you out. Anyway, I digress. Uh, so should we get on to the site? Yeah, that would be great if you want to share your screen. Okay. I'm going to um, share that here. Yeah, so just a, a general overview of what I, I think we'll be covering today. Uh, we'll do a general background and then of the, the database, we'll also get into how people can access it at various levels and then as well as how you can use it in your professional design work. Right, that sounds great. Um, yeah, so this is a, a permacultureplantdata.com, by the way is the URL, permacultureplantdata.com. And uh, this is in uh, Joomla. It was actually in Wiki to begin with, and we had it reprogrammed and rewritten and put in a Joomla. So it's a very powerful uh, plant database, and it's a relational database. And you'll see this as we work in, uh, in the different levels. So here's uh, some little bit of information. Uh, there's Paula's book, Perennial Land. My book, Integrated Forest Gardenings, I did with Wayne Wiseman and, and Bryce Ruddock. And then there's polyculture. So every page on here has information to help you get started. The member login is at the top right, and you do have to log in or register for a free access. Um, and we'll get into the membership in a little bit. A little bit about us and news. Um, yep, there's Paula. There's a little picture of her uh, and her logo and her work. A little bit about her story. And um, I won't go into mine. And a little bit about uh, how the, the workshops, we haven't got a lot in there, but also some news when there's some changes. And you can kind of see the iterations of the, of the plant database over the years as we've kind of changed it. Um, and also some of the countries. At one point, I have to update this, but in uh, 2016, we had 2,200 users, 2,800 users in 70 countries. Now we have over 5,000 uh, users. So yeah, it is, that's pretty cool. Uh, designing with permaculture, which is the basis for everything that we're doing. Uh, fire retardant. I think this was done by 16. I think this was done by um, Rahina in Spain, Rahina Cabo. Uh, either that or it was done by uh, Kellen Kirschberg. So fire is one of the things now that really uh, around the world people are working with. So we're doing research on how do you plant a forest or trees to reduce fire danger or to slow fire down. And actually, all the plants have something. It's amazing. The, the human uses are great, but also the ecological functions of all these plants are pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about the ethics of permaculture, things like that. Um, if you wanted to be a member, um, you can subscribe, of course, uh, and that's free. If you want to have a, a paid membership, there's benefits to that. It's $30 and $50, there's, there's two different levels. And they actually have three now, one is a professional level and that's actually now bringing in some resources for like United Designers resources and um, plant symbols and things like that. Those people that wanna kind of move ahead with the plant database. On an individual level, you, you'll see what we can do. The designer level is basically made for people who are professional because you can download your searches into Excel spreadsheets. And uh, for most people that's, that's the money shot on this plant list, uh, this plant database is being able to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, the plant database has lists of plants. Everything is um, done relationally and you can search by characteristics. You can search by plant type. You can search by ecological function, human use, all of that. And then once you have your list, this is what it looks like when you download the Excel spreadsheet. All the data that we have on that plant for the most part is now in a spreadsheet for you that you can bring into Excel, sort, and this is, and with people who are using it, this is the plant list for every design that we're working on. 
we create it online, then we bring it into an Excel and do our massaging, picking out the plants, resorting, all those kinds of things. And then we cut and paste out of this and put it into our uh, designs or have it, have it printed out. Let's see, here we go. So the plant list itself, oops. <laughs> I have to log in, even me, oh, horrible. Uh, here's the plant list. There we go. And uh, one of the things I need to add here, we have some editing to do on this, is we lost our, remember on, on, on sites where there's long lists, there'll be an alphabet at the top to help you have okay. a shortcut. Well, we lost our alphabet. Hmm. And you don't want to have to keep clicking next about, you know, 30, 40 <laughs> times to get to the plant you want to look at. Yeah. But you can search up here for, uh, you know, different plants you're looking for, Oops, or if you spell it right. Give me an I. Oh, okay. Great. So if you, even though it has the word in it, like wheat or something like that, you can actually get all the plants that have the word wheat in it. So I'm looking for winter wheat or buckwheat or something like that. Uh, or a berry. If you put in berry, you'll get all the berry plants. Hmm. But this is the main list right here. 2,359 plants in this. All alphabetized by common name uh, with our North American bias. But uh, we also have all the scientific names in here too. So if you want to search by scientific name, you would do that on the right in that box. So most people use that because, of course, our common names in, in our imperial English is chaotic and is changing, you know, for the rest of the world. Although, like, cat claw acacia is pretty much common. But if it's in Spanish or if it's in French or if it's a different part of the world or Africa, there's all sorts of names for these things. But scientific name is the only thing that you can really count on. Once you're in here and you do find a plant that you're looking for, so look at the cat claw acacia, you can click on any one of those and then the data sheet opens up. And this is kind of a standard format we have for everything we know about this plant. We have the characteristics. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Can I see that? Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Does that get bigger? Okay, good. Um, so here's cat claw acacia, the family, plant type, which is very important, plant category, woody or herbaceous, basically because uh, it depends upon uh, how it's measured. Um, and there's a, one thing that I'll talk about that in here too. Scientific name, species, and then native to North America, yes or no. It used to just say, before we kind of went more international, just said native question mark. So it was totally North American bias that we had to kind of start squeezing out of all this. So if it's native to North America, yes, we put in there. If you use the metric system, all you have to do is click on the box and awesome. everything changes the metric. And it also does that in your Excel spreadsheets. So if you're working in metric, you just remember to click the box and everything then will be in metric, which I highly prefer. But then again, that's not the world that I live in uh, working with it. So all the plant characteristics, height, spread, growth rate, as much as we know, some things we don't have here, like bacterial fungal ratio, we don't really know. We know that it has an endomycorrhizal fungal association but uh, we don't know what the ratio is, fungal to bacterial ratio for the soil that it's in, basically, what it's looking for. Root type, as you can see, lots of great information here. Sun, soil, uh, soil moisture, uh, like this one, it says dry. So this plant, actually, the characteristics are that it can survive or it prefers dry soil. Fruit type, flower color, and then notes. This little notes box here, uh, is where we dump all the information that we don't have a category for. So that's kind of our solution now is we can't, once you get started with this, we can't really add another category because then you have to go through all the rest of the plants and change them. So other information goes down here. And then all the human uses for this plant. Uh, Cat claw acacia has so many different uses, food, wood, biomass, fiber, aromatic fragrance, um, a couple different kinds of food, coppicing, Ornamental use, oil, wax, resin, and this you'll see in our search page. We have, you can actually search for the plants by these human uses and get a list just based on human uses. And then you can also see on the right, our references, like I was saying, things are cited. So you wanna know where information comes from. And by the way, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, all these places listed here, those are places to visit also. Fantastic information at these sites. Uh, there's one in South Africa that we use a lot also, and you, just, you would just be amazed at the detail that they have on all the plants. 
So human use is big for us, but then also what are the ecological functions of these plants? And this is basically how the plant database started. Paula had all these plant lists, databases, but nothing was ecologically focused. They didn't give you any information about nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators, things like that. So that was the impetus of this website was to give people who wanted to design, design ecologically the resources to be able to do that and have the research done so you can pick out plants based by their ecological function and not, and not just about aesthetics and, uh, and ornamentals and things like that, but actually build polycultures and build plant guilds that way. So this is a, and so every plant uh, page, data page, basically looks like this. And if you have the uh, Acrobat uh, PDF uh, add-on for either, I think they have it in Chrome, I know they have it for Firefox, you can actually download this and convert it to a really nice PDF. You can also print it, but the PDF converter in Firefox actually works pretty nice for that. Uh, and um, let's see here, I'm gonna get out of this and go back to that list here. And then Pete, maybe you wanna field questions. If somebody types in a question in the chat, you just go right ahead. And well, Mike was just was just sharing. This is pretty amazing, and I feel the oh. same way. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It. Oh, let me tell you, I use it constantly, and when I get time, I'm going back and doing some things. I actually just. It's funny because uh, it won't seem like a big thing to you, but I went in the back, the back of this today and changed the pH of wheat <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't right, and I knew it wasn't right, and I went back to the research, oh, no, gotta change the pH there. So that when people do a search at a certain pH for a certain soil, I want, you know, uh, this wheat to come up, you know, for bread making, whatever, uh, triticale, uh, it has to come up the right way. So, you know, we get a little bit excited about that stuff occasionally. And uh, so, um, Nora was, was wondering if this is just in the paid subscription, but this is, this is open access for free. Yeah. Right? Yep. It's, it's if you want to download actual spreadsheets that you can save from your searches that you'd be. That's you know, the paid part. Yeah. Right. So, and that was the deal that we made with uh, like Plants for a Future and other people that supplied us with information. We just tell people, you know, it's open source. It has to be free. The information is. Now, if you want to package it, that's where our expense come in and that's where our, our background stuff has to come in that we need to compensate, get compensated for, put it that way. So doing the searches and then being able to print those out uh, are, the, are the two uh, ends of that. So everybody can look at this. So that's the list. And again, put in the common name here, or uh, you can even partially spell it right. And the scientific name is best you know, fewer letters is better, and then the plants will come up in the list and you can look at the data table. Also, by the way, I should say, you'll see that there's polycultures here. So green American alder, if I click on the polycultures for that, I'll zoom in a little bit. These are naturally occurring polycultures or human uh, polycultures that have been assembled for this particular plant. For, so for, for green, American green alder, and probably a lot of the alders, these are environmental restoration wildlife polycultures that include that plant. So it's a, it's a great, um, accelerator to help you build a guild. So if I want to build, say, the, this is a quail guild using green alder because it's the one that was built, it lists all the plants that are in this polyculture and their human uses and their ecological functions. And if you go all the way to the bottom, oh, that's a lot of plants. Uh, you can export this also in an Excel spreadsheet. Now you have the polyculture itself all in a spreadsheet, ready to go to massage, do whatever you want uh, with that but you also have uh, all the human uses to kind of see. I mean, this is what's amazing about this is not only are you putting in a guild for quail, you're also putting all sorts of things in it for human use, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no one function to any of these systems. It's like all of it has some kind of human use, ecological function. You know, it really is uh, quite kind of integrated systems, which is what we like. We want our natural system to be integrated. So that's one of the polycultures here. Let's see if I can back up. I think Chrome will let me do that. All right, I gotta get back up to my thing here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious also about um, hmm. like building one's own polycultures using this tool as well, whenever we've got. 
Oh, right, right. For that. Yeah, so we'll show that. I kind of lost my backup arrow here. What happened to my, uh, anybody familiar with Chrome? Chrome, I lost my. Uh, uh, maybe there's some toolbar that's not. Yeah, I lost my toolbar. Maybe bar. if you exit full screen, I'm not really sure. Uh, you're right. True. Good. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's what that was. What I was trying to do was just, I didn't want a uh, full screen. I just wanted to have it to fill the screen, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I'll back up to the list again. And here's the list of polycultures still in Green Alder. We just opened one of them. There's quite a few here for that. And that's a place to start. There's wetlands, floodplains, stream banks. So anywhere that American green alder is used in one of these polycultures, those will show up. But most of the plants uh, have that. They'll have polycultures already made. The other column here are plants that are generally found with that plant. So back to American green alder. If you go to seven natural associates is what those are. These plants, and there's lots of good information, are generally found with this plant. So a natural plant associate is basically plants that live in the same ecological community as say American green alder. So these are plants that are commonly found with this other plant. And when you're going through the list, as you see, there aren't a lot of those, but some of them do. Here's gray alder has 13 plants that generally grow with it. That's an instant natural polyculture to start with. Plus it also has 17 other polycultures that people have done work. So this list alone, if you're looking at it, if you're doing apples, or if you're doing anything else, always check out those right through columns and there might be more information for you uh, for that. So like you say, it just, it just keeps de getting deeper and deeper and we haven't even got into the searching. Yeah, so, one, one question we have, and I can keep a kind of a tally of these is, Nora was curious about um, whether you can search according to plant purpose, such as like a riverbed restoration. There is, so we have um, the poly, cultivated polycultures in guild list. And let's see if this will open up for me. Here we go. Uh, and so these are basically the polycultures. There's 108 of those in here. And then you can search for cultivated polycultures based upon what you want to happen. So. Some of them are agricultural human uses. We have ecosystem restoration, environmental eco services, sustainable residential landscape, and wildlife resource services. Um, so these, this is the start. What you'll get from doing these or clicking on one of these, if you're searching for that, is anybody's guess. Uh, this gets very deep into it. We generally say is look for the polycultures, look for the associates. When you're looking for one of these polycultures here say it's full sun and, and sandy loam there's still no zone here right there's a lot of other information show you're going to get a lot of these cultivated ones that probably won't apply so the best thing to do is search for plants based on the function that you want um, but it's a good still uh, it's a good it's a good start so now, go ahead as, as far as uh, climate zones is there a certain range that's best represented or is it pretty even across all USDA climate zones? Oh, right, right. Uh, for the most part, it's as far as North America, the Americas in general, yes, it's very broad based. We have, I know, because somebody asked me, for zone two, uh, I think there's like a hundred and some plants just for zone two that you could do up in the, the North Slope, in these areas where it's very cold. I didn't even know there was a zone 13. We had to actually add a zone. <laughs> Uh, a growing zone. So finally put that in. So like I was saying, we started with the US, we started in the Midwest and kept adding plants. And then as soon as I started traveling more and more and working in the tropics, working in the, in the Middle East, uh, in Europe, every time I'm working on a project or get to know somebody, it's like, hey, let's bring those plants in too, or South Africa, areas like that. So as soon as they hit the tropics, we started bringing tropical plants. Uh, Bryce Ruddock, who's the author of, of our integrated forest gardening, um, he's the plant geek. The guy is brilliant and just digs and digs and digs. He did all basically the pinnace of the world. So he did all the pine trees in the world and tried to find every one he could find so we could have them all in the plant database. And it was very interesting, you know, for somebody to just focus on one, you know, genus. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty amazing uh, what he found out. 
Uh, and what he found out a lot about it was not about us, but in generally the assumptions that people have about pine trees and pitch and all those kinds of things is actually not very correct. So they're very mm. different in what they can do. Toxicity and the sap and all sorts of things, pine cones, you name it. Wow. So, yeah. So um, from that sense, what we try to do is keep adding plants who are big in the tropics, have a lot of tropical plants from the Caribbean, places like that. And we have lists from South Africa. We're working on one that we got from Lebanon. But like I said, a lot of these are just sitting on deck waiting for us to finish the information. So uh, this is the search page. And make that a little bigger. And so uh, this is basically the big tool that everybody's using to get what they need for the plant list. This creates your custom plant list. In our case here in the US, what we do, and I do it if I'm not on site, is I go to the USDA soil web survey and I do my, my soil surveys first to find out what kind of soil am I working in, what's the pH of that soil generally, or we have soil tests. Because without your soil information and your climate information, it's, it's a waste of time. So here we can actually search for plants that are accustomed to or live within the environmental conditions that you're basically defining. So we have plants by family. If you know that a certain plant exists there, you can go look for that uh, family of plants also and get that list. I don't use that a lot, but if you know what's already there and you can find out what family it's in, we call that the ecological analog. Search for plants that are from that family first because the plants themselves are defining what's, what's going on in that area. Now I'll change that to blank. Uh, then you can also search by plant type. Uh, sometimes if you just put in all this information and uh, it's funny, like if I put in a pH of seven and uh, a loamy soil in full sun, well, it's about every plant in the world loves that. <laughs> so you're gonna get like six, 700 plants, which isn't helpful. And plus, after about 450, the database just says, no, you need to do something to make it shorter. So putting in uh, the growing zone, whatever your growing zone is, we don't do the A and Bs, but you can see all the different growing zones here. Get that put in, find the pH of your soil that you wanna put there. I've been down uh, to four, and now we're actually working in a site that's 9.2. Wow. That's new for me. Like, and we're all looking at it and go, I mean, there's plants here. Things are growing. You know, I haven't been there yet, but it's like 9.2. It's what was going on in this? I don't even know what the science is behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of rock did that come from? I so, was, uh, I did a restoration project up in the upper peninsula of Michigan on an old mine tailing, like a, where there were stamp sands from copper mining and the pH was about nine and a half. Yeah. Right. So it's, something, it's heavily, this area is old, heavily eroded. Uh, area so it could be but like I'm saying for every condition there are plants mm -hmm. um, and then you can do things to kind of remediate it changing the pH of a soil though like I say you can try but <laughs> it doesn't stick mm -hmm. because uh, pH comes from below pH comes from the base material the rock it doesn't come from above so every time you're trying to change it by adding things from above just imagine all the eons of energy coming from below that's basically uh, changing it back mm -hmm. what if you need a plant of a certain height or a certain spread, you can actually put that in here and it will generally get plants that are either smaller or within that range because there's a, usually a height spread range, a growth range in there. Uh, don't use that a lot, but if you're next to a building, we have the rule of thirds, uh, the golden mean, all those kinds of things. If I have a, a, you know, an 18 foot building, either I want a six or I want a, a 12 foot tree. Uh, and so I could put in here what size I'm looking for underneath power lines. We have limitations on height and power lines here all over. So I'm going to go to my tree and save some time. Do that. Uh, full sun, partial shade, and shade. Another way to select your plants. Just shade plants is a really good one because we're working in understories. Uh, soil types are all here. Wet soil, dry soil, of course, are very specific. When we say wet, we mean it's wet like mostly all the time. If it's dry nine times out of 10 or nine months of the year, whatever, it's always a dry area that's when you would click those. But most of the time, like in Minnesota, we have moderate soils uh, that we use because of our climate. Uh, tolerances to drought, flood, and salt. Deer, rabbits, go for mice. Those are very specific things. And then if you're building for erosion control and you wanna partition the soil, you can also go by root type. All of this information though comes out in the spreadsheet. 
So once you've done your initial search, you can look at all those things on the spreadsheet and find out uh, the information you need. But if you're looking for fibrous deep roots for erosion control, you can just stick to that and, and have a list right off the bat. Uh, growth rate, growth rate, slow, fast, moderate. Uh, nurse plants, and we're trying to get you're trying to get this windbreak up really fast. We're going to need some fast-growing trees to get that started, and then we'll get behind that some of our low-growing or slow-growing trees. So there's all sorts of purposes in using this. Now, once we get to the ecological functions, this is now where this. Is, and if you'd like the cursor just sit on top of the word, um, you should get an explanation. Let's see if I can get that to stay there. What it, of what it does. Da, 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 da. I don't know, it takes a while to think, I guess. Uh, so each one of these is, is basically an ecological function that plants have. And basically, this is from, right from permaculture. When we're working for ecological functions, you want a lot of plants that do that ecological function, not just one. So you want to have three or four, or five, six, whatever, as many nitrogen fixtures as you can fit in, in there. But the nice thing to know is that plants also have multiple functions. So each function should be represented by multiple plants, and each plant should have multiple functions. That's how you cover and integrate a system. And that's straight, I think that's straight from Mollison. Um, so windbreaks, any of these I can click on, and the plants that have that human, or excuse me, ecological function will show up in the list. Same thing with human uses. Maybe food might be what I want to get right off the bat. I'm not gonna mix it up with limiting it by ecological functions. When you start clicking on a bunch of errant little boxes, either you're gonna get nothing or you're gonna get a ton of plants. You're not being very selective. So you wanna be selective when you do this. You can pick dye and food, but the plants that have both food and have dye are the ones that you're gonna show. So that's why we wanna be general with that. So let's do a search here. Uh, zone five, we're gonna just stick to that. Uh, pH of fat, well, let's make it a, let's make it six. Um, partial shade. Well, let's see what, let's see what happens. We'll go with the simplest rate right now. Now, like I said, if I just click on loamy soil, we're going to get probably too many, uh, and it won't even play. But we'll do a clay soil, um, moderate, and we won't click anything else on here just to see what shows up. And at the bottom is submit, and it says we have 374 plants. So this is now our plant list with just that little information. And I can back up here. So we, all we picked on was zone five, pH of six, clay soils, mod, so it's basically a clay soil and nothing else. So that, what you have is, oops, I have to ask the question, I guess. What you have now is your base plant list because you didn't do any more specifics. And when I export this, these are all the plants that will fit within those environmental conditions. And I didn't get very specific. So this is a very broad list. And then I can use the Excel spreadsheet itself uh, to break that down. Now I'm going to export the list. I click on that. On Chrome, it shows up at the bottom here. And then, oh no, it's opening in numbers. I don't want to open in numbers. <laughs> You don't want to open it in numbers. Uh, so a couple points. What you're downloading here on this, and I, I'm actually kind of a Firefox person myself, um, or excuse me, uh, an Excel. I use Firefox, and what happens is the website downloads a standard CSV file. It's not an Excel file, it's a CSV and which is a standard format for spreadsheets. That way, most any program can open it. Unfortunately, everything except Apple Numbers for some reason, and that's what wants to open it up you know, right away. So I'm gonna go up to my list here. Excuse me, here we go. I'm gonna open that up. Not in Numbers. Uh, the computer thinks that it wants to open up. Now, I think I can get this fixed now, sorry. But yeah, for if you're using Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets, those open up CSV right. files for anyone right. wondering. Um, so this is a this is a glitch within. See, I'm in Chrome. If I was in Firefox, this never would have happened. Uh, but the key is, all you have to do 
to open it, see where it's CSV, you can go into your, your finder or in your directory, change that CSV to XLS, and it will think it's an Excel file and open it up. Wow. All you have to do is change the suffix. It's the CSV that seems to be kind of confusing it, and there's something about our code that does that. All right. So this is now the spreadsheet. Can you guys see this, or do I have to change screens? I can only see the database. Okay. Here we go. Cool. So yeah, I see it now. This is what we exported. Now that's a lot of plants. <laughs> you can imagine. And there's a tab down here. See the tab in the lower left? I'll double click that and I call that plant list because that is the big list of plants. Great. I have everything in here. Uh, back on our, our website. There's actually a template that you can you can form that will format this for you. But the first thing that I want to do is I'll go in here and I do a sort. And I sort by plant type. Oops. And then I sort by uh, scientific name. Because now they're going to be in order. So now I have all the annual plants together. And then they're all ordered by scientific name, which means all my brassicas say are together because the common names, you don't want to put them in alphabetical order by common name because all of these are going to be separate. So to get yourself organized, now I have all the same types of plants are together. So all the annuals are together. Let's see here. How come I can't turn this down? The biennials, the deciduous shrubs. Now everything is order for me to start looking at what I have. And I'll get back to the website here. So if you know Excel, this is going to be a lot of fun. If you don't, it takes a little bit of work to get used to, but it, it still is pretty simple. So a little bit of formatting on this to kind of get it set up. So I think I can also, uh, I'll zoom in on this a little bit to make it a little bit easier. There we go. So in our top row, alliums, amaranthus, amaranthus. Uh, borage and the brassicas, you can see it's going alphabetical. And then all of these now are going to be grouped. So all the brassicas are grouped together. Then you have the type, the height and spread. Another thing I'll do is I'll center that to make it easier to read. And then we have all these different fields here. Uh, seasonal interest, notes, just like we saw the notes on the page, these notes will also be in the spreadsheet. Flower color, if we have it in here. Uh, root type, bloom time, fruit type, I get a couple of these going here, growth rate, the form, which is an upright, and there's a certain specific terms in the, in the trade as far as upright, mound, pyramid, pyramid, uh, those kinds of things, um, columnar. The texture, which is, you know, like grass is very fine and oak leaves are very coarse. Again, kind of an aesthetic um, qualification in there. The growth rate, uh, Insect, uh, insect predation, minor, medium. So, you know, and that's, if it's a major problem with insects, that's basically a red flag to go figure it out. Uh, minor disease problems for that place. Good, minor, not an issue. Now we're on to light, full sun, partial shade or shade. So each plant now going across in here has all that information, but now it's in Excel and it's on your computer and it's not on the internet. So you can start sorting these things and looking at what you have, highlighting, cutting and pasting, and making your own list. And by the way, all the ecological functions are in here. So you can do a, a find and look for all the nitrogen fixers or all the food or the different things that you might have on your soil pH is in here uh, for a range and soil moisture. Some areas are going to be dry, some areas are going to be wet, but now you have partial shade. Uh, I don't see a lot of ones in here with... Uh, well, there's a couple with full shade, mm -hmm. as you can see. So that's the spreadsheet, which you download. Now I'm going to go back to the website. Where am I? Here we go. So we're back here. So that was from our list that we exported. So this list right here is what's in that spreadsheet now. 
Uh, and the only other thing that might not be on the spreadsheet, if we open up uh, some of these, there's a lot of information on here. I think the notes are in there, but these explanations are not. So you'll get the use, but you won't get the narrative, you might say, the explanation of what the use is. That only is on here, because this is not information you put in a spreadsheet. Um, so it's got, already have so many cells in there. So when it is food or something, these are still good pages to go look at to find out uh, more about the plants. Okay. So we'll look at this one more time because even though I have that, that main list, I want to have other lists. And so I have my main list. So I'm not going to change anything on here, but now, oh, that one was just food. I see I had food clicked on here. So I'm going to unclick food, keep that. Let's do another one without food clicked and see what happens. We had 374. Yep, it's too many plants. Hmm. So that's why we had a, a, a smaller list because I just wanted food plants. So everything you saw on that list, I think you can eat. Now, if I do it right now and I say, okay, with those conditions that I have up here, nothing's changed. I'm not changing anything here. I want all the sun plants. My soil is the same pH. All that's kind of the same in here. I'm not going to change that, but I'm going to change. I want this ecological function. So only give me the nitrogen fixers this time. And there's 59. Are all those edible? I didn't have any food, but these are 59 nitrogen fixers now that I can download again and then copy them into that Excel spreadsheet and the tab that's in there. So I will download this uh, as an Excel spreadsheet and you can take the tabs at the bottom and drag it onto another one. And now my nitrogen fixers will be on that same sheet in a separate tab as my food plants. And so I'll have all sorts of different, different tabs on there. I want just the shade ones. I just want the trees or I just want the shrubs and I'll make separate lists for that. But they all came for that main, main plant list. Although I did, I did cut that down quite a bit with, with food. So these are nitrogen fixers and you have polycultures and you have the natural plant associates here. Some of these, which you'll uh, recognize, some which may not, may not be on here. As you can see, we're, we're pretty heavy on the clover. Um, and as far as legumes, uh, not a lot, but then again, we did have a specific range. There's a lot of tropical legumes and uh, nitrogen fixers that probably wouldn't show up. I didn't actually know that licorice was a, considered a nitrogen fixer. Well, you know, um, it's interesting because you have to decide what your qualifier is for a nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and real, long story short, Somebody has, and maybe, uh, Pete, you've heard this story before, but somebody has a website and, a, and videos out there talking about putting honey locusts in your orchard for nitrogen fixing. Um, and actually, black locust, yes. Honey locust, no. Does it fix nitrogen? Yes. Uh, but I like to say that the, the, a nitrogen fixing tree is like my cat. Uh, do all trees fix a little bit of nitrogen? Sure, just from being in the ground things like that. Uh, does my cat humidify the air? Sure. Is it a humidifier? No, it's not. <laughs> right. So I don't tell people that my cat is my air humidifier just because it does add some humidity to the air because it's not enough to matter. So if you do research on like honey locusts, the same thing. Uh, I've got the citations, I got the papers because I was kind of questioning that and there's research on it and said, no, it doesn't. Not enough to appreciably value it as what we would call a nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. So Something on here like licorice, um, I think it's just from the family of plant, but somewhere there was the uh, citation for that. And since you asked the question, let's see if it's still there. No, it's not. I'm going to get that list back. But those are the kinds of things that come up. Where did you see that at the bottom? It's a common name, Glyceriza licorice wild. Oh, there we go. Lepidota, so I don't know if that's wild is another yeah, wild licorice. Mm -hmm. So it says food da, 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 da. nitrogen, very good. Well, that's <laughs> that's not a lot of detail, uh, but it came from Plants for a Future. So there you go. Um, on the other hand, we have a little more detail in wildlife food and, and what it does. Mm -hmm. So very good. I guess that qualifies it. It'd be nice to know. A little bit more about that. Uh, I think that's that's one of the most 
finicky things I found in the in the world of creating a polyculture say is which plants are actually nitrogen fixtures to an appreciable level right and then how do you manage that in order to actually make sure that the, that you're getting the benefit mm -hmm. you know, of the nitrogen fixing so like I did just did with the nitrogen I would come I would come back here and depending upon what my needs are you know maybe I want to put some soil builders or soil cultivator which are tap-rooted plants that break up the soil. You know, if I want to put in nitrogen scavengers, these are things that basically uh, cover crops after you harvest that go and basically bring the nitrogen out of the soil and bring it back up into the plant material. Uh, aromatic pest confusers are great because it keeps the, uh, the pests away in gardens. So you can see like the ecological functions that are here uh, that are available. So, um, that's kind of the, the search on here, and that's how we use the plant database. And I, I certainly like to answer questions that anybody has on this, because uh, those are the major tools now from here. Yeah, we don't have any additional questions. Well, actually, we, we do have one. Um, so Nora was curious about how to um, be able to contribute to the database. So to contribute to the database, uh, we basically hire people to do that. Uh, we have a whole other, actually, two or three websites uh, in the background of this in order to gather the information and uh, prepare it to go into the, to what people see publicly. Um, what we've done in the past is we pay people $10 a plant. Uh, we already have the lists. We have a huge mega spreadsheet that has 7,000 plants on it that are all partially filled. And then we have, like this page you see here, we have a page like that where all the, the, the data is entered. And so the, uh, the editors or the authors will get the information. Uh, Kaya, who did this for a number of years, she actually started in the US, then she moved to Spain. And she lived in Spain for a year while she was working on the plant data mason, made some decent money. She got fast, basically. Um, and so she had money constantly going into her account uh, while she was uh, in Europe. So. Uh, but what we do is we supply the plants list, we supply the basics, and then we kind of help people say, and here's all the sites, here are all the websites, like the um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center or the place in South Africa. But it really is up to the author to figure out their best method in doing this. Uh, Bryce Ruddock is all analog, he's all paper pencil. He knows all the information that he needs to find, does that in his spiral notebooks. I know Kaya did that too. She said she just had to have a page for every plant. And then when she would find a site that had all this great information, she would just hit all the plants on that, get all the blanks filled in. And basically it's about filling in the gaps. Once it's filled in, uh, it gets added to our database. And then Paula, I go through that, verify the information, and then we turn it on and it goes in here. So that's how, if you want to add to it, we have expectations, but we pay for those expectations, moderate amount. But, uh, and usually I would say it takes about an hour uh, for each plant. And then if you hit on the mother trove of information, or there's a lot that you know, sometimes it can be faster, but on the average, that's about what it takes. And anybody could really do that, but they kind of have to know what plants, they have to know plants, um, botany sometimes to really understand where to find the information and what's important. And then you also have to make notes of where you got it, because we can't have just general information flying around. Uh, for people. It's unfair. So we want to make sure that everything is cited that way. But that's how people can contribute. Um, I'm looking at, Warushka knows this too, I've been looking for a Joomla editor uh, for a number of months because uh, we lost our other one. And uh, because we would like to make this the page that you see here, we want to bring in our editor page and allow people to submit plans mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. And so it would make it easier for everybody it's generally getting started, but it's not usable or even close to usable, right? That doesn't work, put it that way. Uh, so what we wanna do is have that available to people so they could actually add plants and they could work on it. And we would actually pay people to finish the plant database. Cause you can imagine if we went from 2,300 to 5,000 with all this specific information that people need, how much more useful that would be around the rest of the world. So we have lists from Lebanon, lists from South Africa, plus all the ones that we have that aren't used. And that's basically how you can add plants. Um, it's a job. <laughs> it's a job for plant geeks that it, it get, you know, get excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about it. 
And uh, as far as the that professional level, I'm I'm curious about what exactly where exactly that is. It sounds like it's it's kind of evolving in terms of right the plant symbols being available, stuff like that. It's our newest level that we have on here. Just to add another level, I think it's $175. Um, I mean, it's right here. I could go look at it for that. And it, what we're trying to do is get people more. Uh, uh, getting into working with the plants and those that are serious, it's another avenue to get into the, the access to the templates. So you can see here, uh, professional access to documentation and assessment, basically working with the United Designers people, although it doesn't come out and say that. Templates and reports for communication with clients during the project, access to Adobe Illustrator symbols, uh, and then through the use of Do Dropbox, access to professional documentation files by the team members. So what we're doing is if you pay to use the plant database at this level, we're also incorporating what you're trying to work on with the rest of the team and United Designers, and now you can be part of that. So uh, it's basically, you can tell that people are kind of serious at what they're doing if they want to spend the money. And since we put this on, we have about five people that have done this. And so I'm working with them to help bring them up to speed. The point with the professional level is if somebody gets this kind of subscription, they're also going to get a lot of help and we're trying to help them move their professional practice up like you repeat. So basically it's another avenue to get into United Designers and start working with the team. We have 20 people in United Designers right now uh, working off and on with each other and that's what we're trying to create more opportunity and the more people we have, the more we can streamline that process. Yeah, so this plant database plus uh, it doesn't teach you and it doesn't pay for Adobe. Uh, Illustrator, but if you know how that works and you want to take the time to learn it, you'll have all the tools and the symbols now with the plant database and then taking the symbols, you can get start getting up to the professional level of what people want to see. And then you can send it to people like me or Warushka or Pete, and we can criticize it. Uh, constructively. No. Constructively, <laughs> yes. So, and I've been working with uh, uh, Ben Missimer in Mississippi, I've been look, working with Warushka. And it is, it's a matter of, I'm working on this project and now we're talking about United Designers, but you know, and you show it to other people and say, what do you think? And you just basically get comments from all these people and hopefully they're gonna do the same thing. And then we all learn that way. Because we're, we're trying to raise the standard and have a standard of practice for how things are shown in designs. So it kind of raises permaculture and it raises the design and then we all just look that much better. Because we're all kind of trying to tweak, to, to move our design skills up to get fast at it. And that's the other part of United Designers too, is you gotta turn this stuff around. You know, mm -hmm. so spread the love, get more people involved. It'll look better. You get much better information. Uh, Rushka just helped me in uh, Poland on something. And it's like, she knows that place. She's from the Netherlands, right? So it's like, it's like right across the street. <laughs> so, uh, but that's what that's about. And so this is another avenue to get into that. But this is also kind of the first level now you have to start bringing up your game with Illustrator, all the other research. Because as you can imagine, as soon as you start getting into the plant list and start working with the plants, um, that's a lot. That's a lot to think about and a lot to put together. And it takes a lot of spiral notebooks with lots of little scratches and things to put together the polycultures. Mm -hmm. But the more you do, every time you it's do one, we add it to the library. Exactly. So that's how the more of us that are working with polycultures, the more polycultures the more symbols, all those things are available now for people to use. Um, and, and structures, I have a really nice SUV. Have you seen my SUV symbol? Very nice. Oh yeah, uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, even think a well, an SUV, you know, things like that. Warushka's rocks, I mean, I have to tell you the best rocks I've ever seen for gabions or whatever you might want to do. Awesome. Um, but that's the fun, you know, it's like, okay, oh, that was great, you know, let's you know, work on that. So. That's how we, we're moving ourselves forward. Anyway, back to the plant database. Those are the memberships for that. Um, the individual one is that you can do searches and get the list. The designer one is you can do the search and then download the Excel spreadsheet. And the designer one is what people are doing when they're, you know, have bigger projects that they're working on. Uh, and those are annual, basically annual subscriptions. And by the way, there's a ton of YouTube training videos for the plant database. And, and Illustrator too. 
been working on. So all of this is is part of that. Um, if you take a, by the way, if you take a, a a design class, either through United Designers or through myself or some other people, this is part of those classes too. I have one coming up this weekend in Minneapolis. It's a two-day food forest class with Rob Zernick. So everybody who takes the class basically get they're working on this anyway in the course, and then you have it for a year or longer as long until I remember to turn it off. Uh, so you actually have access to this. So there's a, a couple other questions here. Um, Mike was curious about being able to upgrade mid, like mid year subscription, like halfway not through. His. Yeah, not a problem. People do that all the time. They get the individual one and they say, oh, can you change it? And yeah, as you can imagine, it's just me clicking dots and little switches. So. And is there a best way to contact you, Dan, to be able to add plants or if somebody has a question about membership? Right, you can email me off the site. I think we have a contact in the bottom or somewhere here. You can email me directly. Cool. Uh, Southwoodcenter.com is my website. Let's look at the bottom here. Awesome. Isn't there, isn't there supposed to be a contact us here somewhere? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's uh... not your website. <laughs> Yeah, somewhere in here. Oh, by the way, we also have a discussion page. I didn't really show that. Um, but we have like a forum uh, where people ask questions about different plants, mistakes, things that might need to be fixed, um, all those kinds of things. So that's kind of, doesn't get used a lot, but if somebody puts a question in there, I'll answer to that. Cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even know about that forum. That's great. Yeah. And I can actually, since since I'm sharing a screen, you see this is the data manager. This is our, our online data entry area that we're trying to build that only mm. I can see it because I'm the administrator. Um, and the plant list, let's see if this will open up. It has issues. Um, <laughs> what can happen here, data manager. Might be my tablet or something. Here. So the I, the idea of something like this would be for anyone who's adding plant info, they can right. access that directly. You basically, and it'd be again a number of levels of membership. So like yeah. designer mem level people could actually submit plants as they're working on things. Cool. Or and what I really want to get to, like here, this is uh, like shag bark hickory. These are a strange order. It's another thing. But right now, if I click on this. I can actually go, it takes me to the data entry page. And this is where we put all the information. Oh, wow. Okay. Right there. Um, but what works great for me is when people ask a question, do you have this plant? We probably already have it in the background, but you know, what do you know about this plant? Can you put it in the plant database and people to make suggestions? That's another level that we want to get to. You know, it's not like you're going to, you know, we're asking people to sponsor a plant or anything like that, but. Uh, if it's important to you, it's important to us to make sure that it's there for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So, so that's kind of a whirlwind sort of uh, <laughs> uh, tour, but the plant list itself, just going down and looking for plants in here and perusing those is, is worth an afternoon because there's lots of great information. Yeah, in there. absolutely. I, I'm really appreciative of you guys for putting this together. Everybody's worked on this. It's, it's already amazing. And I know that, as we get the word out about it and everyone starts to use it more, it's really going to become a phenomenal yeah. resource. Right. And then we'll have uh, the money that we get really, most of it just goes back into it and, and buying more plant time. So all of the income really just goes to that. Uh, although, cool. although we, we did get its own computer now. So <laughs> plant database has its own computer. It was so happy. Otherwise it's been just happy uh, birthday plant database. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't it be great? You know, and I was just thinking today too, wouldn't it be fun on Earth Day? You know, we could open up the plant database to anybody. You could go in and search. I think that'd be nice for like all of Earth Day. You could go and do searches, download Excel spreadsheets, all of that. It'd be, it'd be like a gateway drug, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very healthy one, hopefully. Yeah. 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 That's a cool idea. So, uh, but yeah, this is... Uh, a lot of great information in there. We're still, you know, occasionally getting back to work on it, but right now it's it's about all we're using uh, for my list and that. And then when I'm working on other things, I try to bring them in there too, you know, and uh, keep adding to it as we have the time. But anybody who wants to be an author or an editor, 
always looking for people to do that. It's just that it is a lot of work and you really do have to be a geek to enjoy it you know, to, to get the work done. Yeah, I know we already have some people in the group who are interested in that too. So that's, that's great to see. And then uh, Warushka, I'm, uh, I'm committing her to this. She says, I'll make the campaign banner for the <laughs> Earth Day. <laughs> uh oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I think that'd be fun. Although it would have to be because everybody's going to be outside, right? So it would have to be, couldn't have it during the day. It would have to be in the evening or the next day. Yeah, or have it for like 24 hours. I'll let you guys figure out the logistics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like we don't have enough to do, right? Yeah. We add more stuff to our life. These permaculture designers sitting around looking at yeah. trees. So, um, yeah. And so there, yeah. And I will, there is other information on here, by the way, just to let you know. So about polyculture design, uh, indoor cleaning plants, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, these are, are really fun to, and it basically researched a lot of this for building polycultures for air cleaning plants and what they do. And I was really amazed about the chemicals that these plants removed. And so that's why I yeah. had to give them their own page. Interior um, rewilding. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's a, and it actually, a lot of this came from NASA because they wanted to use plants on the space station to clean wow. the air. Uh, but they found just the weight of the plants and the water and the soil was not, uh, didn't, didn't work for them. So mm. uh, the more kind of things that we get in, the more in time we have, we're just adding little uh you know little ideas and little things to think about when we're when you're working on your designs too very cool so uh and if anyone has another question at this time you can uh type that in otherwise i think we'll we'll start wrapping up um but this was wonderfully helpful and wochik says impressive and very useful database thank you for this presentation i think we all feel the same way um it's, uh, you know, obviously we went through things pretty quickly, but at the same time, I feel like we really were able to see a great overview of the utility of the tool while we're working. And especially, you know, that, that spreadsheet, the ability to download that and put that into our own plant lists and um, yeah, really understand so much more of the benefits our, we ourselves and the people we work with and for are getting from these plants. Mm -hmm. You know, the next one we should do should be with just the spreadsheet because that's like the whole, okay. Because the designers will get on here, like even myself, I'm on and off in five minutes. I get my lists, right? Mm -hmm. And now I'm in Excel. And that's where a lot of the heavy work gets done. Yeah. Going through that list, getting things arranged. So that might be another one that we should do is, okay, now that you've got your list, you got to get, it's now it's all just raw data. You got to get that organized. What am I going to do with this? Yeah. Going to work. And that might be kind of fun. Again, it's tough to see in a screen, but um you know it all just gets put in a folder and you just keep staring at this information and after a while it just starts to gel uh, and uh, starts to create different patterns in your head of how you can uh, have your solutions yeah yeah it would be really interesting to see to work with look at the spreadsheets that you used for other projects as well so we could see how they informed your design yeah. decision and actually we have uh yeah, I wish some of them, I can't show you that one. Uh, Warushka knows what I'm talking about. Uh, we're working on a very secret design for somebody that we can't tell anybody about, uh, which is very irritating um, <laughs> until they actually decide to do it. This is, this is, you know, it's a cool project, but it's probably one of the most ornate and well-organized plant lists I've ever had mm. um, to work with, but that's because it was such a complex uh, site that we're working on. But yeah, we can go through that because it is, it's about getting organized. You keep thinning it out and thinning it out, and getting down to what you want. And that would be a good process to go through because once, that's the nice thing about Excel, once you pick your plants out, now you have another tab and you start picking them out for your polyculture. So you start naming those things in there too. So mm -hmm. all these tools are very helpful with doing that. Cause it's, you know, it's great to get outside and put all these things in, but the nice thing is you have all the documentation and you've gone through all of the, you know, the paperwork basically and the calculations to make sure that things are going to go together well. Yeah, exactly. And then on the, in the actual implementation installation of these projects, we have documentation of why did we make that decision if, if it was successful or if it was not so successful. Yeah. And if you guys said, you know what, I, sh I should share one more screen with you if, if I can. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. 
I'll show you one specifically um, where this is.